we should come back at uh, how about 10:05. appreciate your your understanding that we were running behind oh yeah yeah no, not a problem and part of it is I, I apologize great clarity like, we're all good judge we're all good we come back at 10 that i can actually be there i'll be up front i'll be there in this in the main thing take me out Take you off completely, or you want to go in there?
order. This is not the parliament. Okay, so uh, we are ready to start our uh, first panel, uh, which is more like a revised version of uh, curved dais uh, in comparison with the round table we had, and where it's going to be a little bit more, if I may, anarchical, because we're going to let the Panelists run the show as much as possible. The, po the point here is not for me to be boring my students with what they already can get from me, but to hear from the experts uh, that are on the trenches in, in DC right now and, and their amazing experience and discussion. Just a, a very brief uh, comment. Uh, in light of Judge Gordon's uh, remark about the history of the CIT, and Larry's comments about how much gets done in terms, of, uh, in terms of trade in New York City, it should be clear that the name of the present panel, uh, Trade Administration and Enforcement, a DC update, uh, needs some qualification. To help us on that qualification, let me ask the members of the audience, what was the first case tried in the United States by a judge appointed to the first court organized in our nation? Anybody know that? What was the first case tried in the United States by a judge appointed to the first court organized in the land? Yes, Heather Doherty is absolutely right. Yes. <laughs> well, there were, there were a couple of hints, right? If the question being asked in a trade and customs law conference isn't enough, is enough of a clue, those who thought trade or customs uh, uh, Trade or customs case are absolutely correct. The first case uh, tried in the new courts of the United States on Tuesday, November 3rd, 1789, to be specific, had to do with the amount of customs duty on certain Iron Maiden ports. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, United States v. three boxes of iron mongery. I'll repeat, United States v. versus three boxes of ironmongery. Ironmongery is uh, basically a general term that describes things made out of iron, stuff made out of iron, you know, uh, uh, utensils, I, I guess. Was tried before District Court of New York, uh, Judge James Duane, an appointee of President George Washington. Even more interesting, Duane Street is where the CIT now sits. Uh, just across the street from to what became uh, the Southern District of New York. And Judge Gordon, uh, if he were here, he would actually uh, compliment, because I mentioned this last night to him. And uh, he says, and there's something more interesting about that. Uh, apparently, uh, the first case was supposed to be uh, with the District of New Jersey. But something happened, and then the first case ended up being uh, 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 in New York. But it's a, a fairly uh, uh, interesting part of, of town. I, uh, uh, so you, we should all get to know. So yes, uh, much of trade lawyering uh, is done in DC. The Federal Circuit is located there. Hey, hey. Sorry? I'm here. Oh, right, right. So yes, much of trade law is done in DC. The Federal Circuit is located there. But as much as it hurts for me, a Boston uh, team fan, to recognize New York City is not the only home of the CIT, but the birthplace of US trade law and litigation. Uh, with this qualification out of the way, uh, of course, as uh, our customs colleagues are, are, are correct to remind us, trade law is practiced everywhere in the land, everywhere in the United States, but uh, the, the, the court of first resort, the subject matter specific court in the CIT in New York City. Uh, with this qualification out of the way, our speakers in this panel operate out of our nation's capital and are well-seasoned experts on what happens in present-day Duane Street. Okay, so now let's uh, talk a little bit how we are, we are set up for today. What we're going to have is a, a, a very brief uh, five-minute uh, or longer, if they want, they run the show, uh, uh, the initial remarks by each of our guests. And then following these remarks, they're going to uh, have a curved table, if you will, uh, discussion. And then uh, we're going to open, we're going to provide for more time for audience questions this time around. So let me start with uh, by introducing uh, our uh, first speaker, uh, Jim, uh, James Cannon. Uh, James, Jim Cannon is an international trade attorney and partner 
in the law firm of Cassidy Levy, uh, USA, Kent, USA, LP in Washington, D.C. For over 30 years, Mr. Kennan had been, has been involved in diverse international trade matters, including anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases, uh, at, at escape clause actions, export control, uh, uh, exportation of controlled commodities. Uh, Mr. Kennan uh, regularly appears before the U.S. Department of Commerce, the International Trade Commission, the Bureau of Customs and Border Protection, the U.S. Trade Representative, and via various federal courts. Our next, uh, following Mr. Cannon, we're going to have uh, uh, Michelle Lynch, uh, who might not remember me when I was a very junior associate shaking in my legs uh, when I came to my first uh, hearing and, uh, and I had to uh, present some issues and I was introduced to her at the Department of Commerce. Michelle uh, Lynch is Assistant Chief Counsel for Litigation in the Office of uh, Chief Counsel for the, the Trade Enforcement and Compliance at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, she, her responsibilities since joining Commerce in 2001 include uh, trade and U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal uh, uh, Representation before Court of International Trade and U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. She's also uh, instrumental in the government's defense of uh, uh, administrative uh, determinations before NAFTA panels, various World Trade Organization panels, and the WTO appellate body. Uh, Ms. Lynch is an active member of the Court of International uh, Trade's Rules Advisory Committee and is on the board of Customs of the Customs and International Trade Bar Association. Prior to her experience uh, with the Department of uh, Justice, uh, with the Department of Commerce, she was a trial attorney with the Department of Justice, and uh, Ms. Lynch is also a graduate of Gifford, Guilford College and the George Washington University uh, Law School. And finally. Uh, our final uh, uh, member of our distinguished uh, DC expert panel, Dominic Bianchi, uh, General Counsel of the United States uh, Trade Commission. He serves as the, uh, the, the Trade Commission's uh, chief legal advisor. He, uh, in his office, he provides legal advice and support uh, to the commissioners and US ITC staff on investigations and research studies. Uh, they also represent uh, the ITC in all litigation involving uh, determinations and activities, as well as providing assistance and adv advice on administrative law matters. Uh, we were we briefly touched upon this. The ITC also has a system of administrative law judges. Uh, besides its work, its tremendous work on uh, trade remedies and preparing reports for con for Congress, it's a f uh, it's an amazingly a busy uh, agency, just as commerce is. Uh, prior to his appointment, Mr. Bianchi has served in several roles at the uh, ITC, including acting, acting general counsel, chief of staff under chairman Dina Tanner Oaken, and congressional relations officer. Uh, he is a, uh, he practiced at our uh, now defunct firm, our sweet old uh, Dewey Ballantyne. Uh, I never thought I would refer to Dewey like this, but I miss those <laughs> days. I do miss those days very much. Bianchi holds a Juris Doctor degree from George University, uh, Georgetown University Law Center and a Bachelor of Science from Northwestern University. Please join me in welcome our wonderful... Uh, good morning. My name is Jim Cannon. I'm with the law firm of Cassidy Levy Kent. Uh, so, uh, initial disclosure I am a protectionist. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to talk about essentially three things. Uh, first, uh, kind of the policy balance right now. The title of the overall conference was Changing Times. We are in some changing times, and when we talk about a DC update, uh, I think it's relevant to start there. Secondly, I want to talk about some of the more recent changes to U.S. laws, both legislatively and in decisions that implement this balance. And then thirdly, I want to talk just briefly about the WTO, and then I'll quit. Uh, so I'm a lawyer. So, so how many of you here are law students? Raise your hand. Okay, so I actually have some practicing lawyers too or the rest of you professors, if you're a practicing lawyer, raise your hand. Okay. 
So I'm just trying to figure out, though, so have the law students, do you know anything? Have you taken an international trade course? Three. If I say anti-dumping, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Three or four, okay. So I need to, okay, I'm just trying to gauge how basic do I need to be. Jim, I think they think you're gonna call them. I am gonna call them. <laughs> That'll get us through the day, right? Some, some of them did not raise their hands. <laughs> <laughs> so you heard Judge Gordon, and I just told you I was a protectionist, so let's bring back the whips. <laughs> okay. Now, having said that, we also heard Professor Kolaris, and he, he, he interestingly cited an economist for the concept that free trade is in and protectionism is out. Okay. Now, we all know, and I'm now talking about my first point, policy balance. We all know because we watch elections, uh, uh, debates, or maybe we don't. Um, but we all know that trade is actually, the word has been used on television. Now, I've been practicing trade law for, I don't know, a long time. A long time. Uh, over 30 years. So. Trade has never been maybe a top 10 even issue. In fact, I saw a presentation on this at uh, another conference a couple of years ago, and, and there was a PowerPoint, and it was showing they were polling Americans, and trade and trade issues uh, never rose above, like, number eight in the list. And now both candidates actually talk about it. So this is a change, right? It is current, it is somewhat different, but um, don't be fooled. The protectionists are not happy, okay? There is not uh, sort of a massive shift. There is a balance, and there always has been, and it's built in, right? It's built into the system. So on the one hand, as a lawyer, and I represent a lot of U.S. companies in Ohio, uh, in Warren, and in uh, Cleveland, in fact. Um, Brush Wellman's just up the road. Um, as a U.S. attorney who represents U.S. companies, you know, it, it actually makes me feel good if I bring a trade case and I keep some imports out of the United States, and one of those factories puts 400 people back to work, right? I certainly do not lose sleep over that. I feel great about that. Now, I, in truth, I will also disclose, I represent some Chinese, too. I represent some foreign companies. I represent U.S. companies who import, because we live in a complicated world. You aren't on one side or this or the other, right? You're a multinational. You import, you also make here. So, but truth is, like, I don't, you know, if 400 people went back to work in China, yeah, I don't know how I feel. Not so great. These are my personal views, obviously. Um, having said that, uh, there is this balance, and the balance plays out in our policy and in a DC update. An update might be that while we are focused on this in the election, it doesn't mean that by any means, uh, uh, the imperative for free trade, so to speak, writ large, you know, is gone. In fact, an example of that is the TPP. Okay, so in Washington we use acronyms. That's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. You guys have heard of this. Okay. I, I always worry, when I go to court, I always worry about using all the DC acronyms where the judges actually know what we're talking about. <laughs> Um, at any rate, so both presidential candidates have bashed this. We should not be doing it, okay? Well, right now, while we're in the lame duck session, I can tell you there is absolutely an active program underway to pass it, and it very well could, right? And we have a bunch of clients. There are major, the business roundtable, the U.S. Chamber, the National Association of Manufacturers even, there are major forces in corporate America who want to see that pass. And th th that interest group is still out there, and it very well could. I mean, it could happen. I, you know, Lots of things could happen. I'm just, by way of saying that there, the balance still exists. 
right? You may hear more about one side or the other, but it's still there. So let's talk about an update on legislation. So what you do see is how the balance works in the recent uh, legislation. So in 2015, we had the Trade Preferences Extension Act, and that was sort of a good example of a package that brought this together. So we have the, uh, we want to get uh, another acronym, TPA, right? Trade Promotion Authority. Old people call this fast track. We wanted to get this in the law so that we could negotiate the TPP. The trade-off for that was we had to add some other elements to the package. And whenever Congress passes Trade Promotion Authority, they'll always be implementing legislation and it'll have some goals, and some of those will be protectionist goals because that's how you buy the votes to get the whole package into law. So in the implementing legislation on the Trade Preferences Extension Act, on the one hand, you had AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. You had GSP extension. So these are rules that provide for duty-free treatment of imports. On the other hand, you had changes to the, um, uh, the injury test applied by the ITC which uh, made it easier to show captive production. Okay, this is a very key issue to one industry, the U.S. steel industry, and that's why it's in the law, and it made a change that makes it easier to invoke this provision. We had um, changes to the way we implement at commerce the dumping law, and an example would be now uh, we don't have to make sales below cost allegations. It eases our burden as private litigants. The agency automatically has to investigate this. Or um, we had another change to the injury test at the ITC, where we, the commission now has to consider uh, profit in a whole variety of ways that's explicit in the law. Actually, they used to do it, but now it's explicit in the law. Yeah, I wouldn't have paid very much for that legislation myself. But, you know, uh, another big change. <laughs> another change we had is um, in, this, in this mix, right? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so that is an example, the Trade Preferences Extension Act, of this balance, right? So the macro balance that we talk about in public, in the policy, in the speeches, gets reflected it in this more micro level of U.S. legislation, which actually in this package you see the balance actually uh, literally written into our law. Um, then we also had another uh, statute uh, passed called Enforce, um, which uh, tasks customs with sort of getting tough on imports, with enforcing trade remedies uh, more effectively. Um, in that, you might look at that and say, well, there's sort of a victory for the protectionist side, right? Because they're getting this law written, which is going to make things, uh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to improve enforcement, so to speak. Uh, well, that remains to be seen. Uh, the regulations only now being written. A lot have been said about it. Uh, the, the procedures they've set up are, at the moment at least, um, uh, almost illusory. The first case that was filed, they didn't even initiate. Uh, and it, it's unclear that the agency that administers this has any enthusiasm. So, so whether or not the Congress wants to pass a law and say, yeah, get a little more protectionist, it's entirely unclear that's what's going to happen uh, with the administration. Now I'd like to move from that to some of the decisions, uh, uh, some of the more recent decisions. And so in the context of a DC update, and thinking in terms of this you know, theme, how we're balancing, um, there are several cases uh, which illustrate uh, the US approach and that it, it sort of works both ways. So one area is uh, what we call scope. So in dumping and countermeasuring duty cases, which apply to price discrimination or subsidies, you have to define the scope of the case, what product is included. Right? And there are some very broadly written 
cases. One of them that's famous is aluminum extrusions. It covers all kinds of things. Aluminum extrusion isn't just an aluminum extrusion. It could be a window or it could be a screen door and still be an aluminum extrusion. As long as it's not quite finished, it's still an extrusion, even if the value of the aluminum is only a fraction of the total value. And this is a wonderful case. I wish I had thought of writing all my scope <laughs> this way. Uh, it's also generated a huge amount of uh, both uh, decisions from the Commerce Department and litigation. Uh -huh. what, it, what it teaches, though, is that the Commerce Department is not, as a petitioner, appealing to them. They are not, they're not a pushover. Okay, we, we, they actually apply a set of principles and sit in judgment. <laughs> you seem so surprised. I am. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. So e even if you're a Whig, <laughs> you still have to, you still have to have, I just love this because you know my hairdo, right? So you still have to have facts in the law and apply it, right? Just as you see in all the decisions. And the Commerce Department and the level down below the legislation, or down, different, implementing it, also is applying the same balance, right? There's not this you might think biased, despite the changing times, both the departments and the ITC and the courts also main, keep maintaining this balance. And you see that long term in the decisions. If you were to look, for example, at ITC decisions over 30 years, the negative to positive balance, when did they go affirmative? When did they go negative? It's almost 50 50. I mean, it's right there. Now, um, the same thing, the Commerce Department, they have some invisible compass in their mind, somebody's mind in there. There's an ideal dumping law, and they've been kind of trying to implement this for years. And so when the courts or the Congress or the parties argue in a certain way and tilt the balance a little bit, Commerce always trues back up, because somewhere there's a this is my theory. Somewhere there's this guiding principle held by the gurus inside commerce. So what happens then is you'll get cases like steel cases. Right now we're in the midst of these big steel cases. Right now we're in this hot political environment. We have an election coming. In an election year, there's a lot of pressure. Steelworkers have a lot of votes. They want to win their cases. Right? So you get pressure, and the Commerce Department is still trying to apply the rules fairly, right? And so what happens then is you get litigation. And that's when the courts come in and they can say, look, you went too far on one side or the other. In the court's view, in recent case this year, Hugh Steele 16-76 CIT, Commerce went too far in calculating constructive value profit. And that's a technical thing, but what that means is the dumping rate they calculated on oil country tubular goods from Korea, the court thought it was too high. It needs to be lower. You pull the number out of the air, go back and tell us, give us a better reason for the number, more or less. Um, <laughs> um, so the decisions currently and the cases so steel is one, and that's an example of a whole raft of decisions. Uh, another uh, issue for that steel cases is at the ITC. And there again, you see this balance that I'm talking about, uh, essentially win-loss record when you're a litigant. Uh, then we move from those decisions to the WTO. Now you heard in the first panel, international trade law in the US is a US construct, right? It's U.S. statutes. All, I do the same thing as essentially like a tax lawyer, right? I apply U.S. law. That's what I argue. So sitting somewhere out there beside, above, whatever, there's another level of review, and this is the WTO. So we signed an international agreement, and we made ourselves, the United States, subject to the dispute settlement mechanism under this WTO. And so the appellate body 
of the WTO is allowed to review U.S. legal decisions. And, and uh, last year, you know, in terms of my D.C. update, I can point to two major decisions against both of these agencies in which, in both cases, the U.S. court has affirmed, sometimes repeatedly, U.S. law. And a WTO appellate body said, well, no, that's, you're wrong. This is inconsistent with the WTO. So there you have a situation where a sovereign government, the United States, through its courts, has repeatedly ruled a certain way. And the WTO appellate body has, has struck this down. And this issue arose really right after the Euro Uruguay Round Agreements Act, right? I mean, right after it was filed. Um, and <laughs> I'm getting to see the I'm going on too long. Uh, I, I think it's interesting because it also shows that whether we tilt the balance in the short term because of one election one way or the other, right? Whether we, through some legislation, can get the Enforce Act in the law or not, we still have the international agreement out there and that's pushing in a completely opposite direction. One in which the Whigs, the petitioners, have no standing, right? If I win a dumping case, I can't go to the WTO and appeal because Commerce made some decision and gave me a smaller dumping duty than I think. I, I can't do that because I'm not the United States and the United States isn't gonna appeal its own decision. So it's a one-way track. Dumping and countervailing duty cases at the WTO level are only going to uh, be overturned. They can't be affirmed. I can't appeal a negative, right? So outside of this balance, we have this, at least from the private practitioner standpoint, this WTO system. And so there I will stop, see my time. Uh, thank you, Professor Kalaris, for letting us be here. Thank you for listening. Um, I think this is on. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, first, before I say anything else, I wanted to thank Professor Kalaris and Belania for making all the travel arrangements. It was very seamless to get up here to be here this morning. And um, second, and most importantly probably, I have to announce that whatever I say today, these are my own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of the United States Department of Commerce, or nor should they be construed to be opinions of the Department of Commerce. Um, so it's interesting to me to listen to Jim talk about balance. If you have been involved in trade at all over the last three or four years, you will realize that on October 1st of 2013, my client at Commerce underwent a name change. It used to be the Import Administration, which was a noun and easy to write in a brief. And then on October 1st, 2013, the day the government shut down for a month, um, we were pushing FRs out, the Federal Register notices out the door to undergo a slight reorganization but more importantly, a name change, and so now we are a non-noun, enforcement and compliance. And it makes it very difficult to write that in a brief because it's not a noun. So it's you know, not the enforcement and compliance agency, it's not the enforcement and compliance unit, it's just enforcement and compliance. So um, the powers that be are interested in enforcement these days. I mean, that is clear. Uh, as Jim said, we had a new law passed just last summer, I think it was last summer, and it, the, the short name for it is the Enforce Act, and that's a customs, mostly customs specific law. Um, two summers ago, in, in 2015, we had the Trade Preferences Act passed that has um, enforcement mechanisms in it. So it's clear that the balance, if, to the extent there is a balance, and I, I deem my agency to be like a fulcrum of the balance, um, it's clear that the uh, not that there was never a trend towards enforcement, but the uh, overt trend is towards enforcement of our trade remedies law. And trade remedies is only, like if you had a chessboard, what I do is almost blinkered, right? I mean, I'm just one little tiny piece on the chessboard doing ADCVD law or dumping and countervailing duty subsidy law. Um, and others, Dominic's agency does the injury portion of that. Our good friends at Customs and Border Protection, they do the collection of all the uh, duties that we assess. 
Um, earlier this morning, somebody asked about, uh, shouldn't there, you know, didn't one of the candidates say that we needed a trade prosecutor? I think our colleagues at the uh, U.S. Trade Representative's Office would submit to you that they are the trade prosecutor, right? But the, the fact, the, the way that they manage trade is they have to look at the whole chessboard. They don't get to just limit their view to just trade remedies. And for those of us in the trade remedies field, it would be really nice if they would r limit their view to what's happening over here instead of, in a weird way, kind of selling us down the river for what's happening in the agriculture sector, right? So it is, I mean, trade encompasses a lot of different, uh, a lot of different moving parts in D.C. And it, it's interesting to me because there is slight overlap in some of the agencies, one would think, but it really, in the implementation, there is no overlap. I mean, each agency has its own specific purpose and its own specific statutes and its own specific regulations under which they, they act and they react to what's happening. Um, I know Professor Kolaris uh, indicated earlier today, as did Larry, that if you're interested in international trade, you should take administrative law. Um, that would be extremely helpful to you because on a daily basis, my attorneys, and Heather can attest to this, my colleagues, they go nowhere without their regulations. I came up here with my regulations. I don't know that I'm going to use them. And my statute, because as a trade remedies attorney, you can't go to a meeting without your regs and your statute. You would, you know, be laughed out of our offices because our client at ENC is a bunch of very sophisticated um, attorneys, economists, um, just analysts, right? And they are almost more well-versed in the law than the attorneys are. So if you're very new to the office and you come in and you get, you know, obviously, we call it the dog dump. You get the dog dump of cases when you're new to my office. Um, and you go off to your first meeting with our client, they're going to be sitting there with their well-thumbed and well-tabbed regulations looking at you to give them an answer. And you're sitting there going, well, what do you have in your hand? Oh, that's the regulations, right? So, so when you're new to the trade remedies area, you really need to, do, you know, know administrative law. Um, I thought that Jim thought it was interesting that he said out loud that we actually have a, a principled basis upon which we reach decisions. I find that to be true as well. The statute and the regulations guide us. Um, my client, uh, as I said, was ve is very well versed in the statute and the regulations and um, often has its finger on the pulse as things are being drafted for the agencies to implement. Um, that's not to say that every statute that comes out has been run by the agencies. I think uh, occasionally we are surprised by the language that drops from Congress. Um, I was in Geneva last summer and I saw just like a little blurb that some law had been passed and I was over there on a WTO matter and I was like, well, that's nice. Ignored. I came back to my office in DC and I kept being invited to these meetings. Michelle, aren't you going to come to these meetings on this, you know, this TPFEA? And I'm like, nah, not interested. Right? Somebody comes in, aren't you going to come to this meeting? I'm like, why? Why would I? And finally, my deputy comes in and says, because they changed our law. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like who knew, right? So for about two weeks, I was like in totally oblivious to the fact that Congress had dropped a new law changing five important, well, four for me and one for Dominic, aspects of our law, um, just dropped out of nowhere, just Tunk, right? And here we have new aspects of the law. But for my purposes, the, the 2015 Act, for our agency's purposes, I w wasn't that significant because most of the things that got changed weren't really changes. It was just codification of our existing practice, um, which is great for the agency because then we don't have to fight so hard with the parties and then we don't have to argue so hard at the court because now our practice is, has been codified as law. Um, the new Enforce Act is, I see as mostly a customs issue. Um, there is one interesting aspect to that because, as Jim indicated, we have scope cases, which are now, when I started at Commerce, I think the scope cases might have been less than 1% of our cases on an annual basis. And now, I don't know, I want to say 50% of my casework for my attorneys is relegated to scope issues. Um, and I don't know whether that's a function of poorly crafted orders, i.e. aluminum extrusions, um, or, you know, you might as well just have an order on aluminum, right? I mean, every product that comes in, somebody's arguing it's in or out, it's in or out, and we have to sit there and try to decide as an agency where does that fit in the, the whole anti-dumping or countervailing duty order. And so it consumes a lot of, a lot of uh, time and space for the agency. Um, and this new act over the summer, I would say petitioners, were concerned that um, there was evasion going on and that companies were bringing in products that should be subject to our orders and instead of classifying them as subject to our orders, they were bringing them in duty-free. Um, and we do see a lot of fraud in the trade remedies context. 
So now there's a law that Customs has to get involved, and Customs is now required when somebody raises an allegation, or I think if another agency raises the allegation that there's evasion, Customs has to initiate its own um, investigation about whether that product actually is supposed to be within the, within the scope of a commerce order. Um, I will note that I call it the get out of jail free part of the of that statute, or the, is that at any point in time, Customs can refer that matter to my agency. And when Customs refers the matter to my agency, all of the deadlines in the statute are told, right? So to the extent that the, to the extent that it seems like it's a quick fix and that Customs within a certain amount of time, I think they have a total of 300 days, so a little bit less than a year to do the whole investigation. But at any point in time, once they kick it over to the Commerce Department and we start a scope, if we initiate a scope, I think we have 245 days to do that. So anyway, scope is a big thing for us right now. Um, China, uh, 2016 is a huge thing at our agency. Um, stay tuned. I'm not allowed to talk about that, but stay tuned. That's going to be, you know, that's in all the journals right now. Everybody's wondering what's going to happen, and I suppose something might happen in a in a few weeks. Um, the um, I think earlier today, just Gordon and Larry were talking about. Um, what happens when you have a WTO case that goes one way and the court case has found in favor of the agency repeatedly? Um, zeroing, for instance, over and over again, we won zeroing. We won it with the judges at the CIT. We won it repeatedly at our appellate court. Over and over again, zeroing we won. At the same time that was happening, we were consistently losing, not with the panels at the WTO, but with the appellate body of the WTO. The six, I don't know whether you said they were higher or lower than everybody, but the six members of the appellate body. Um, and. <laughs> I have my own opinion about where they should be in the hierarchy. But um, what happens is when the agency decides, or and it's not a singular decision, right? The, the law is crafted so that it's in consultation with uh, the trade rep's office, it's in consultation with Congress. And so when, the, when a decision is made as to whether or not to um, adopt the, the findings of the appellate body, um, you can decide how you're going to do that so you're not uh, retaliated against. And so normally what happens is the WTO decision is a prospective decision. So it'll start from a certain date and go forward. And the, the agency holds on to the court decisions as you know, applying retroactively to all of the entries that might have come in prior to that point in time. I think that I've probably exhausted my time. I think I'm just seeing a little time frame there. So let Dominic continue. Good to know that there's a time, uh, time clock there. Um, good morning. I want to uh, uh, thank um, everyone for the invitation, for being on the panel with uh, uh, my distinguished colleagues, and for you coming out to uh, listen to us and hopefully learn from us. Um, a couple of things. I'll try to keep my points short, but more responsive, and then we can open it up to some questions. Um, Number one, I think that we have a, Jim's right, we have two presidential candidates who are talking about trade. Um, I would note that we did have that back in 92 with uh, uh, NAFTA, uh, but this is a different type of discussion that's going on um, about trade in general. Um, but more importantly, with something that uh, Judge Gordon raised this morning, this is, there's ebbs and flows, okay? If you look at the history of the United States, you'll see where there will be instances where uh, we may become more protectionist, and then there are times where we will uh, move more toward free trade. And in fact, I would say, you know, instead of what Jim said as saying, hello, I'm a protectionist, I'd say I'm bipolar. <laughs> Um, because I've played both roles before. Um, I've worked at Dewey Ballantyne, which is, uh, which many would argue is nothing but a protection, was a protectionist law firm. Uh, we would describe it differently at the time. Um, and I've also worked at the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, which is trying to negotiate uh, more open trade. Um, and I've worked for a Republican commissioner um, who was very, I feel very balanced, but for a, a number of years she was writing dissents until she was able to persuade her other colleagues that, uh, um, you know, we should be interpreting the law in a different way um, that would get you a little bit more to the balance of uh, what Jim was referring to as 50-50. Um, 
I would argue that uh, we're not at 50-50 anymore. Um, each time that you have a new set of commissioners come in, uh, there's a, uh, you know, they commissioners serve a nine-year term uh, or longer um, because there's a holdover uh, provision in the statute. Uh, and I would argue that uh, there's a learning curve and a comfort level that, uh, uh, comes with uh, someone who is sitting uh, making decisions and I'm sure Judge Gordon would say that too that uh, you know a new judge uh, may evolve over time of how <clears throat> he or she is interpreting the law um, I'm not saying one's either right or wrong I'm just saying it's it's a growth opportunity um, a couple other things I would say, uh, as, and I regret not saying this before, but it, um, I will say I, I am here uh, representing myself and not the agency, so whatever I say is my own views since I've already gone out on a limb. Um, <clears throat> I would also say a couple other things, which is a, the ITC is in a unique position. Um, but most trade agencies can say that. Um, what's nice about the ITC having served in both uh, uh, in the executive branch uh, in a policymaking agency and also uh, helping out on the congressional side, the ITC doesn't do policy. So we're at a nice juncture, and that's why I've been at the ITC for 15 years, um, where we provide information and advice to policymakers, uh, the commission, uh, also uh, acts uh, in a quasi-judicial manner. Um, those are the cases that go before the CIT um, or they go before the Federal Circuit uh, if they're on the intellectual property side. Um, and it's, it's a nice kind of intersection between trying to do what's right. You're implementing either statutes or regulations um, and you are, um, you don't have to worry about uh, whether or not you're getting the right policy or whether or not you have to be advocating for the right policy. Now, we advise the policymakers. Our clients are the U.S. Trade Representative and they're the <clears throat> Ways and Means and Finance Committees of Congress. Um, and they're the policymakers. So they come to us and ask for information and advice. Um, we try to do it in a very independent and nonpartisan way. Um, and hopefully that will inform the policymaking process. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. I've had many laws uh, dropped upon us where uh, there was little if any consultation and then there are times where we've had extensive consultation with Congress. Um, so I will uh, close up by saying, you know, a lot of, we all do um, import injury work here. Um, that's our specialty. Um, the ITC also does other types of trade practice. One is on the intellectual property side. Uh, happy if anyone has questions about that to answer questions. Um, we also, as I said, uh, provide information and advice to policymakers. It's our fact-finding side of the agency. Um, and then we also um, uh, uh, maintain the harmonized tariff schedule of the United States. So that allows customs to uh, then uh, interpret uh, the HTS and uh, collect the duties at the border. Um, and a new law was just passed in, uh, was uh, enacted in uh, May, a uh, long time coming, uh, which deals with uh, the tariff, um, uh, the tariff schedule, uh, which is called the miscellaneous tariff uh, bill. That's what they've always been called, miscellaneous tariff bills, uh, which gives temporary duty suspensions. And that's the, you know, the long time ago policy idea behind it was if you do not have domestic production of a certain product or you have very minimal production of that product, um, why should a uh, another manufacturer who's importing that product, why should we be collecting tariffs on that? Um, it makes us less competitive as a nation, um, both you know helping out our consumers, but also if they turn around and export their products, you know we're collecting a tax, if you will, on an import which can't or hasn't been manufactured in the United States. Now they're temporary in nature, uh, uh, usually lasting about two years, 
um, because you never know if domestic production will start up of that product. Um, anyway, long story short, there was a, that process got bogged down in Congress. The last time they passed uh, an MTB was in 2010. Um, and it's uh, completely got bogged down, and they passed a statute in, in uh, May, which uh, transfers more of the process and makes it more transparent over to us. And we just started implementing that this month, uh, collecting petitions for uh, seeking relief, and then we have to do our analysis and send it up to Congress, and then we'll see whether or not Congress passes it. Um, but anyway, um, I'm happy to... Uh, uh, I guess we will engage in our uh, questions of ourselves, and then we will open it up to you and uh, look forward to the discussion. Can I just ask a question to Jim? And that can motivate uh, discussions. In my international trade law class, we are covering zeroing now. And I usually do a chart on, my, on the board where I write, you know, uh, uh, we have a, an original uh, a decision on E.C. Bedlam in 2001 uh, where the appellate body strikes down the application of uh, zeroing in, in original AD investigations. Then following that, you have uh, U.S. corrosion resistant steel, uh, dissented review, determination. Uh, the appellate body does not hold the, the it strikes it down, but not in holding in dicta. Uh, the use of zeroing in uh, in subject reviews. Then uh, I believe the next step in the progression is uh, 2005 uh, U.S. laws, uh, regulations, and methodology of zeroing, 2006, uh, where again the appellate body strikes down zeroing on administrative reviews. The Department of Commerce uh, in Greensburg basically announces that it's no longer doing. Uh, during, during in original AD dumping investigations. Uh, then, of course, you have the court's iterations before the, the trade courts. And then, uh, uh, just uh, was it last month already, uh, that the appellate body announced it uh, 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 strikes down uh, the Department of Commerce's uh, application of uh, zero target dumping uh, investigations. Basically, what you see is an erosion, a gradual but sure erosion of the practice of doing from the from the engine dumping agreement, and uh, clearly this is not what the United States uh, negotiated. This is not in the language. This is uh, out of control. Asking this, and I've written about it. Uh, WTO. Uh, I would like to uh, see uh, beginning with Jim because uh, I know uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, a private practitioner. He's more fitted perhaps to. Uh, what would be, uh, other than basically barring or uh, uh, the occasional South Korean arbitrator that decides uh, uh, <laughs> 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 that basically that basically decides to try even issues that are not raised in the terms of reference of a WTO team, what, what else can the United States do? So, actually I feel like I did too much talking on our panel. I should let other folks speak. But I, what could the United States do? So you're correct that the um, zeroing issue has this evolution of uh, which is all downhill in the sense you cannot, you just can't do it. It used to be the case that everyone's, everyone did it, not just the U.S., all countries. Bed linens is easy. They, everyone else targets. They all do targeted dumping. In fact, that's where the EC went in the wake of bed linens. They started doing targeted dumping. The problem the United States government has is that they are the most transparent. When we apply the law, we are the most transparent jurisdiction. It was observed that we're not civil law jurisdiction. Our law is not just the actual words of the, of the WTO agreement. We implement it. When in a far more detailed way. Our regulations and our statute are much more into the weeds. And we have disclosure of confidential information and of calculations and lawyers who all fight about this. And so it is much more wide open what we do. It's totally transparent. It's a computer program. And the Commerce Department has strived for objectivity. They have said, let's just have a system and it doesn't matter 
It's not going to be in the eye of the beholder. They are attempting to use a computer program to do a, uh, a calculation to find is there a pattern? Are there sales that are targeted and these are more dumped? And we will only zero with respect to those sales. And the appellate body has, has essentially rejected this on the strength of, in my view, a misapplication of the standard of review, which was written into the dispute settlement mechanism, it was written into the anti-dumping code, I'm sorry. It, and they've never gotten it right. Um, so, so what can the United States do? Well, at the immediate level, what they can do is probably there's a path to still zero in targeted dumping. We, at least as we read the opinion. There is a way to continue doing what we do. The problem that come, arises is that it, it's making it harder and harder for the department to do this in this sort of neutral and objective way because they are forcing them to look at more subjective criteria, which will, may make it actually more difficult to be fair. Um, and it's interesting because I, I think the WTO appellate body frequently does not understand they're, these are always double-edged swords. These issues always cut both ways. Um, anyway, I'll, I'm sorry. I talked too much again. So. <laughs> personal opinion about what the United States can do or maybe perhaps has been doing. Um, the dispute settlement understanding for the WTO has very short timelines. I mean, if you take a look at it, uh, briefs are due really quickly. I mean, the turnaround time, I think, for the appellate body is like 30 days or some crazy thing for a brief once the opposing counsel files their brief. Um, so the dispute settlement itself is supposed to be wrapped up, you know, in, a, in short order because they wanted consistency and predictability. Well, I dare say that parties appearing before the WTO for the past few years have had uh, much lengthier times to brief their cases. Um, we had a case filed, Indonesian paper was filed, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago when our briefs were just submitted. So the Secretariat is finding itself scrambling for resources right now, right? Why would that be? Because the WTO is member funded, right? So the members have to fund the WTO or the WTO doesn't get the resources that it needs to complete its tasks. Now, it, it just seems interesting to me that the past few years the WTO Secretariat, the panel um, Secretariat and the appellate body Secretariat have been overwhelmed with cases and not able to schedule the cases the way they're, you know, on the timing that they're supposed to be able to schedule the cases on. Um, that's not to say anybody's withholding money from them, but it just seems interesting to me that that has been happening over the past few years. And as a beneficiary of the fact that you can have now a longer chance, you know, longer opportunity to get your brief together and file it, I, I appreciate the, the longer period of time. Um, but it is very challenging for the agency. And as Jim said, if you go back and you're looking in your class at zeroing, you will see that everybody zeroed at the time the WTO agreements were entered. I mean, that's, that was the norm. And in a prior round, the Tokyo round, I think it was, um, somebody, I think it was Japan maybe, had had a proposition that they cease zeroing and they write that into the agreement that they take it, you know, that zeroing come out of the agreements and that was shot down. So that language was not included in the agreement, right? Because nobody agreed that zeroing would not be allowed. But with respect to the common law and the code country, uh, review process, things just don't work the way that those of us in the United States are used to in terms of review. Um, I'm not going to talk about zeroing, uh, thank goodness. Um, I avoided it when I left uh, Dewey and uh, haven't had to touch it since. But there is an example uh, of a recent uh, WTO appellate body decision uh, that affects uh, my agency, um, and that deals with what's called cross-cumulation. So when you have, uh, uh, oftentimes when uh, 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 an industry is seeking relief from uh, dumped and subsidized imports, they will uh, bundle together a bunch of countries and uh, file petitions on them. And then under uh, our statute, we are supposed to uh, uh, if certain provisions are made, we, cro we accumulate um, all the countries together. Um, and likewise, we, uh, what's termed as cross-cumulation, we accumulate the countries whether they're, uh, they have dumped or subsidized imports. Um, the WTO came out uh, now almost two years ago and said 
you can't do that. So let's take an example of you have 10 countries who are um, uh, 10 countries, a case with 10 countries, nine of them are, and I'll make this very simple, nine of them are dumping, uh, the allegations are for dumping, and one country is subsidizing their products. So the idea is that you have to, under the WTO decision, you need to tr treat the, um, do a separate analysis uh, for the subsidized country and don't uh, group them together. Um, I don't think the WTO got it right, but what I will say, okay, I do understand how the U.S. courts, and it was the CIT back in the 1980s, um, and went to the Federal Circuit later on in the 1980s, I do see how the U.S. courts came to one decision, and I also see how the WTO WTO came from to a different decision. So in the U.S. statute, accumulation is a provision that applies both to uh, dumping and to uh, uh, countervailing duties. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a standalone section that applies to both. Um, and under the WTO, the agreements were negotiated. So you have the, uh, the dumping agreement and the um, uh, subsidy and countervailing duty agreement. Um, they were, uh, accumulation was inserted in both of those agreements. Um, so again, I don't think that the WTO got it right, but I do understand if you look at the hierarchy of how uh, agreements were drafted or where the statutes were drafted where one could uh, depart. Um, and, and we'll see, I mean, but, you know, we're in a very um, precarious situation because under U.S. law, we did uh, go back and analyze uh, that one case. It was an India hot roll case. Um, separately, and the commission still um, found that um, there was injury, um, so the you know the orders stay in place. Um, but the way the U.S. Um, uh, and the way the WTO decided that case was, this is a one-off case. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to me to see whether or not uh, another country brings a case uh, to the WTO that um, uh, will be more uh, broad ranging. And then if the commission were to change its practice, then we'd end up in front of the courts. Uh, we are again running a little bit behind. So let's open uh, for a couple of questions from the audience. And I will ask our experts to Limit your, their answers to one minute responses at most <laughs> so that we can break and uh, uh, make the time during break. Thank you. Hello. Okay, thanks for your performance sharing. It's very inspiring. Uh, my question is about 2012 GPS law. And as we know, in 2012, the Congress already uh, retroactivated, authorized uh, um, the Department of Commerce to impose the CVD duties on NME merchandise. And then Chinese government filed a lawsuit in the CIT, and right now this case has been decided by the, um, the Federal Appellate Court. So my question is, what, what is uh, your opinion about the constitutionality of this law, and could you please share some uh, your experience or opinions about the issues? Thank you. Sure, that's one of my favorite things. Um, People often ask whether it matters whether there's, a, whether there's a Republican or a Democrat as my assistant secretary. And I would point out to you, for GPX, in less than 90 days, the whole Congress acted in, in concert to change a trade law. All right? And the reason they changed the trade law was because the Federal Circuit, in my opinion, humble opinion, got it wrong and said that for some unknown reason we couldn't apply the uh, CVD law to, to non-market economy countries. Obviously, the intent of the law and of the Congress was that we could. So within less than 90 days, they got together, they passed a law, the law is in effect, and that's the way the U.S. system works. Is it constitutional? Absolutely. Um, were some of the judges at the Federal Circuit very pleased with the fact that the law changed? I don't think it mattered to them. Um, you know, they're, they're charged with applying the law as it stands, um, and that's just the way it works in the United States. And that it happily worked in my opinion the right way as a person who worked on the case. It happily worked, it happily worked the right way. And Congress was very reactive, all of them. I think it was 97 to zero, I think, the vote on that law.
just just in the interest of time, I'll yield some of my time on the next panel so you can an answer this one. Just taking your hats off in particular as government officials again, do you think um, AV or uh, anti-dumping CVD practice, what will it look like in 10 years? And the reason I ask that, I mean, for these law students here, will trade remedies practice look the same? Because building off of Jim's comment, I was struck by the balanced comment and then the historical discussion this morning is if you save, are trying to save 400 jobs uh, here in the United States through protectionism, well, aluminum extrusions is going to put 400 people out of work about 12 miles down the street that are um, importing all the finished goods that Home Depot and Lowe's sell out from China. Um, and I'm from Warren, Ohio, by the way. So uh, just a shout out. And NAFTA is not a four-letter word there, but it's usually preceded or followed by one. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, we see, we see that type of... So that's the balancing act that we generally see, right? Winners and losers. But then we also have, in, in a world of integrated global value chains, where I have, for example, clients that on the one hand, for example, in the solar panel industry, want the import inputs to come in duty free, of course, but then there's protectionism on those. But of course, when they're selling those damn things, they want as, you know, as protectionism as we can get, and they're screaming at the Canadians about fit and everything else. So it just, uh, I guess my question is, does this model, uh, when we're talking about trading goods, still apply to the 21st century global value chain system? And, have, and I'll give you as much time as you want for my next panel. All right, I'll pretend to answer this question. Um, in, uh, well, in 1988, when I was in law school, which is 100 years ago, um, the big cases back then were the uh, ball bearings cases, right? The Japanese ball bearings cases. And it was the same thing, right? The uh, allegations were that the Japanese companies were literally running the U.S. ball bearings companies out of business. And there were, I mean, for the congressional hearings, they had... Uh, documents, you know, letters and not emails because we didn't even know that that existed. I mean, that was way in the future, right? Um, but they had letters and everything from the Japanese companies basically saying that their purpose was to drive the U.S. ball bearings industry out of business. So, and that obviously was displacing workers, you know, putting ball bearings workers out of business. They're, you know, because they had the, uh, the uh, Defense Act, you know, made in America, you, you still had to keep bearings and certain steel products for uh, application in certain defense industry mechanisms. Um, there were still a few companies that managed to survive that. But I don't see that it's any different now than it was then. I mean, there's more globalization in the fact that Jim might be representing a client who, you know, does have a subsidiary that might be an importer and Weirdly, he's supposed to be on the other side of the V at this time, right? It, it makes it very confusing for me at Commerce because we used to have petitioning law firms and respondent law firms, and now they kind of like morph. It's kind of, it's hard to understand what's happening. But no, I, I, I think that the problems that, are, that exist today existed back then. I don't, uh, you know, it was the same thing. Displaced workers, uh, companies going out of business because other countries' products were trying to displace them in our marketplace. But then you had, just as rejoinder, you had Japanese companies and U.S. companies. We're now, We're now they're yeah. Japanese and U.S. I, it's, so, it's you know. I, the judge, I, I know the court struggles with this as well, and um, I see it, my, my, my staff sees this on a daily basis. People come in and we're like, you know that law firm represents so-and-so. Didn't they represent so-and-so last time? And it really, you know, I have to take myself back 100 years to my ethics class, and I'm like, can they do that? <laughs> right? And, and then your brain's like, well, I guess they must have the right waivers, but can you waive that? Right? But my office, we, luckily for me, we don't have to deal with all the ethics stuff. That's a bar issue, right? So if some, I mean, you don't want the Department of Commerce deciding, you know, which attorneys are ethical and which are not. I mean, that's just, we don't have to deal with that. But, but, for, for attorneys writ large, I mean, that's a question. I, I, I share your concern with respect to the attorneys. So, yeah, I, I, think as, I think as the economic models change, um, there's going to be opportunities for creative lawyering, and there will be opportunities, and, and the field will morph and adjust to it. I mean, in, in my comments, I mean, I think back to my early part of my career where we were focusing on privatization of state-owned industries in Europe, right? And as, as I talk through, you go from state-owned industries to privatization. Then you go from, you know, state-managed economies and state-controlled economies. So I think as the world modifies its economic models, um, you, there are going to be plenty of opportunities, and it's going to morph across different sectors and, and industries. Um, 
you know, there'll be some expansion at times for opportunities for lawyers and economists in this area, and there's going to be some contraction at times. I, but, but I do think that the law in this regard, very candidly, is going to be reactive. It's not going to be ahead of the curve. It's going to have to respond to the driving forces in the economic models in globalization. And that, because lawyers are terribly uh, creative and inventive, will will provide opportunities. Uh, I was actually going to morph the question and, a and ask the three of you, you know, what opportunities or what thought processes do you see evolving uh, f for creative lawyering uh, outside of the, the normative um, roles uh, that, that exist? You know, for example, like enforcement, you see either a key TAM action or a private right of action that is going on in the Central District of, of California, I think, regarding the, I can't remember whether it's the shrimp or the garlic industry, you see all of these. Uh, it, th there was actions in the 337 a area as a result of some uh, decision making. The question is, we sit here talk about traditional customs and international trade, but what opportunities exist for lawyers to be creative outside of kind of that normative approach? Do you want to do <laughs> well, what are you saying? <clears throat> so, so, Your Honor's point, as I would rephrase it perhaps, is that from our perspective as private lawyers, those problems will always be there. In other words, trade friction, right? And so therefore, it's our job to figure out, well, what's the remedy? So if the, if the WTO takes the, the dumping law away from me, for example, if China at the, the end of this year has to be treated as a market economy or something like that, we'll just find another remedy. I mean, there are lots of laws. I mean, I <laughs> <laughs> you can draft lots of laws. <laughs> so, so in that context, what you are seeing is that the people are doing exactly what you're suggesting. There have been actually quite a few key TAM cases, which are perhaps a more effective way of enforcing even than taking something to the custom service. Um, there is now, uh, there have been a slew of 337 cases which don't just allege a patent violation or a, um, a classic sort of palming off, passing off, uh, classic unfair trade, you know, common law unfair trade cause of action. There, you're now seeing other types of causes of action. In essence, an antitrust or predatory pricing cause of action uh, or almost an anti-dumping cause of action being brought as uh, in the guise of or in the form of what you might think of as a common law unfair trade action. And that is kind of the, f the forefront or the cutting edge in a sense of, of private finding... Private versus private party litigation not involving any government agency. Well, no. Well, I'm talking other about, than this us. This is at 337. <laughs> key TAM. The key, the key TAM. Right. right. Well, it's key government, right? Because you, Justice you start... The song. I, I, a private party, sue the... Right, and then the government okay. comes in and takes over. Well, the idea is they would take over and then I get a third or whatever, I, right? So it's a very lucrative business to be yeah. a to be a relator or a moiety in a key TAM action. Um, but well, Dominic has a very interesting three three seven case. So if he wants to talk about it, it's very interesting. Uh, sure. Well, I guess I would uh, I'd like to say a couple of things. Number one, it, as it I think always has been, it still is. It's a great time to be a lawyer. Okay, because when you, every time that, and I've been, I've been doing import injury cases for a long time, and every time you say, oh, I think we've, <laughs> you know, we've come to the last interesting type of issue, then something else crops up. So that's where a lawyer who is well-versed in all different practices of law um, and who is creative can, you know, can challenge an agency, can challenge um, an idea, or ch can challenge a law, and, and you may be able to open up a new practice area. So that's number one. Number two, kind of getting back to your question, import injury, uh, ADCVD, I'm not worried about going away. Okay, I know there's been a lot of talk about that. Number, number one, I would say, 
there have been more, the caseload at my agency is as, is as high as it has been in over 15 years. It was back in 2001 when we had a slew of dump counterbell cases filed plus a, the steel 201 filed that, you know, we haven't been as busy as we are now. Um, and more importantly, I don't care what the, well, I do care, but I should say I don't really care too much about what the WTO does because you just see every other country out there using dump counterbell right now. In fact, what one of the issues that we have going on as a country is how much do we pursue what other countries are doing, uh, implementing their dump countervail laws. Um, and then on the 337 case, is it a new, you know, there there have been a couple still 337 cases filed. Um, there's a big one that was filed um, this summer. Um, it is ongoing, and as Jim referenced, it does involve three different concepts. Uh, one is dealing with antitrust or price fixing, um, which one could, uh, you know, analogize to a dump counter rail. I need to be careful about that because if it is, then it goes over to commerce. We, we quickly kicked it back to him. Yeah, well. Um, but there's the trade secret theft. And if you think about globalized company, companies, you know, what you're seeing more and more of nowadays and what we're seeing more cases of is not necessarily a uh, infringement of a patent. It's that the trade secrets have moved overseas. Um, um, it happens inside a country, but in this case, to uh, you know, to bring a complaint under 337, it had to have moved overseas. Um, and then the third one is the false designation of origin, um, which gets into you know the traditional kind of customs areas. Uh, it will be fascinating to see how it plays out. I know that a lot of people who have been involved in the uh, traditional dump countervail side of, of the light of the bar uh, is wondering whether this will be a new uh, a new way to go um, and time will see uh, the Commission will uh, the ALJ that's been assigned to will hold uh, her first hearing on one of the uh, on the trade secret theft uh, in April and then on the other two matters in August and uh, her opinion is due out uh, November 2nd of, um, of uh, next year, and then the commission's decision is due out uh, March of the following year. But uh, um, anyway. Can I, just follow, can I just end one question? I apologize. You asked about the constitutionality of the GPX decision, and this is going to worry me all the way home, so I'll have to say this. The, um, the mandate for the federal circuit had not yet dropped. Okay, So the federal circuit's decision was not yet final when the law changed. Okay, so that is why the change in law was constitutional, or and that's why the Federal Circuit had to follow the law. Okay, I apologize. I should have said that earlier, and that has been worrying me. With that, <laughs> with that clarification, we're running a little bit behind. Uh, let's take a five-minute break and then rejoin for our last uh, panel uh, of particular importance to our students. Thank you. And uh, join me in, 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 in thanking our experts.
Case uh, 2013, as well as Zach, we were classmates together. I'm currently an assistant prosecutor with the county, um, and uh, I also am an adjunct here where I am the managing director of the Canada U.S. Law Institute, and that's how Juscelino uh, was kind enough to approach me to uh, moderate this panel. Uh, we'll just be talking today with some other case alums and uh, discuss what they've been doing in international trade and why they enjoy it and, and what they think the, the future holds for it. So. Um, as soon as Dan gets back, we'll get going. But uh, I'll start just with the introductions. Uh, just to my left is Heather Doherty. She is a uh, alum from here, uh, 2012, I believe. 2011. 2011. Yeah. Okay. Um, and is attorney with the Office of the Chief Counsel for Trade, uh, based in New York. Correct. Uh, DC. DC. Okay. I'm one of uh, Michelle's staff. Okay. Um, and uh, prior to this, uh, she spent time uh, clerking with several international agencies, including the Special Tribunal for Lebanon um, and Sierra Leone in The Hague, uh, and then got in, started uh, with a clerkship in international trade uh, in Geneva with uh, the, a joint agency, correct? WTO and uh, United Nations Development Program. Uh, they have an international trade center uh, there where she first started working in the trade area. After that, she clerked with uh, Department of Commerce. Um, CIT. CIT was next, where I learned a lot from Judge Gordon. <laughs> Had some really great mentors so far. Yeah, yeah, um, great. So, and then next up is uh, Zach Walker, one of my classmates here, uh, class of 2013, um, is currently clerking uh, with uh, Judge Ridgeway at the CIT in New York. So. And then uh, we have uh, John Yermick on the end there. John is a graduate, also a graduate of Case, uh, class of 90. And uh, he's been working in the international trade area for over 20 years, um, counseling clients on a whole host of issues uh, before many agencies, including Customs and Border Pat Protection, uh, U.S. International Trade Commission, among others. And uh, last but not least, we have Dan so class of 2001, correct, Dan? All right. And uh, also practice in international trade with Dickinson Wright. Um, also currently spearheading a, a joint Canada-U.S. platform, uh, which is trying to bring together a whole host of um, groups, both public, private, uh, to, to come, come up with a, a common platform for the way forward for Canada-U.S. Uh, trade relations, but also just relations in general. So. Um, well, I know we're a little bit limited on time, so we'll just get right into it. Um, I guess we can just go right to left. Heather, if you want to jump in on, on the first question, which is, uh, you know, what originally compelled you to be interested in trade, and, and what about it do you find most uh, interesting? Uh, well, I am the daughter of a small business owner, so he did HVAC, heating, ventilating, air conditioning. So I've always been really interested in business. And, um, and then I studied politics and economics in undergrad. Um, and I wanted to do trade development. But when I started working at the International Trade Center, I found the, um, the nuts and bolts of domestic trade more interesting. So um, what, and the question is what? what? What do you find most interesting about? Uh, what I find most interesting about international trade is um, the important global issues you get to work with on a daily basis and how they affect um, both the, the global grander scale of things and also like um, the panels were talking about earlier, the daily jobs of steel workers. We had um, a senator come in and talk to us about you know some of the steel cases and, and the impacts they're having on everyday lives and people's jobs in the US. So I like that it's like both domestic and international and every day we deal with new facts, um, new things are happening, even though it's the same law. So that's always really interesting to me. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Dan, I'd ask you those same two. What originally got you interested in, and what do you find most compelling about it? Uh, growing up, I had absolutely no interest in international trade. Um, to be candid with you, like I said, I was from, I'm from here. I'm from Northeastern Ohio. I'm from what was formerly known as the Rust Belt. Uh, Although I can say as a young guy cutting steel at Copper Weld Steel, I was always struck by in our community, which had Delphi, Packard Electric, George Lordstown GM, that there was always a, a huge buy, a buy America. But at the same time, all the steel I was cutting and straightening was going to Japanese suppliers for Honda down in Marysville. 
Ohio. So it, the, the two worlds never made sense, but it was actually sitting in that third seat up there in the second row where I got interested in international trade. Um, it was my first year of law school. At a, I was attending a moot court um, practice round, and you could tell law school had done its job where I had no social life <laughs> because I was attending a moot court practice. I was, you know, when was I? I wasn't even in it. You know, I was just here for the free food, I think. But, um, <laughs> but Case Western had, you know, I had traveled abroad when I was at the Ohio State University. I actually worked at the European Union. They didn't have Americans at the time, but with my last name, it wasn't too hard to smuggle me in as a Hungarian. Um, but uh, it was actually Case Western has this legacy. Uh, both strong public international law through, which is we now see with Dean Scharf, and, and at the time there was Henry King, who was a former Nuremberg prosecutor here, who became my mentor, but he was also the former uh, uh, general counsel for international at TRW, the largest tier one automotive supplier. Uh, and Henry, kind of, in wanting to work with him on the kind of sexy side of the International Criminal Court, said you also have to run our Canada US Law Institute. My response then was who the hell cares about Canada really and little did I know the next 25 years of my life would be dedicated to it. Uh, but that started here and you know we were raised, I was raised by the International Trade Bar in DC, people like Dick Cunningham and others uh, and in Toronto and that all started here. Um, what I love about it and, and we'll talk more I think about our specific practice areas but for me it's all about the companies. It's, it's getting out with the companies that Number one, in an export environment, are trying to grow, um, and completely, you know, most of these companies are completely clueless as to how the international arena works when you're talking about small, middle-sized companies. So you're helping them grow, create jobs, and all of those things. And then on the far end, it's always fun to fight with USCBP and, and other types of people. No, but I mean, you're you're looking at it because it is, as a, my question earlier indicated. Um, this isn't a dynamic time. I think it's a transformative time, actually, in terms of how we're balancing security and trade and also global supply chains and other things and watching companies navigate that. But just as a tip, if a company as a lawyer ever asks you to go out onto their shop floor, the answer is always yes, right? Because they want to show you what they're doing. But for some reason, we as lawyers are like, oh, no, I don't have the time to do that. You know, you always do what your client wants, by the way, um, unless it's unethical. And, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it off to, to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I came to international trade by way of my interest in like, economic, international economics. Um, you know, I did my master's in trade where I, you know, read Ho Jun Chang and Daniel Roderick, and I was really interested in, you know, the interactions between trade and growth and democratic policies and uh, international economic integration. And so going to the uh, Court of International Trade was like something that I really wanted to do before I even came to law school. Um, and, you know, I think Judge Ridgway wouldn't let me get away from this presentation without trying to sell everyone here on applying for a clerkship or an internship at the court. It's a great place to work. You have great judges, um, and it's really a supportive environment. Um, but one of the things about the court that it really was interested is because I think Heather would confirm this. Every single case is international. If you're interested in international law of any kind, there's no other court you can go to in the country where every single decision has impacts both domestically and abroad, and it's, that's a really makes it really special. So that's kind of what got me into it. Uh, I'm the old timer on the panel. Uh, as Ted mentioned, uh, I graduated from this law school more than 20 years ago, 1990. I didn't take a single international trade class. I don't think that they were offered at the time. Um, and my early years uh, in practice was as an insurance defense lawyer um, doing trial work. And then I uh, began my own practice more than 20 years ago now and began representing a number of uh, small mid-sized companies, as, as Dan mentioned. And I'm, I'm with Dan. Anytime you can put on goggles or a hard hat or go have to put on a clean room garment to go see the cool technology that's being developed, that's what it's all about. You really have to know what your clients are doing in order to effectively represent their interests. Uh, but as I began advising small companies uh, on business matters and contracts, um, it, it dawned on me that uh, even the smallest companies are sourcing, importing, and certainly looking to export and grow their companies. And I decided at that time to uh, embrace 
international trade and business and learn as much as I could. So I went about educating myself by attending a lot of CLEs at the DC bar um, on 337 litigation, on what every lawyer needs to know about customs law, about FCPA. And uh, I made a transformation and uh, happily so. Uh, my practice uh, in the last five years is 100% international trade. Uh, and it's been a long process. It's not uh, a, a route that you should uh, take by any means. So learn from me in how not to go about a <laughs> long winding career into international trade law. But um, I'm on both the custom side. I get to deal with, uh, not, I'm not litigating the, uh, the, the cases at the ITC, the dumping and, and countervailing duty cases. I'm usually advising the companies on, yeah, customs has got you here. You do have to pay that 188% anti-dumping rate. Uh, but I've had successes as well um, in getting scope rulings issued that find products outside of the aluminum extrusions order. Uh, amazingly so. Uh, I've advised Canadian companies on, no, your, ex your telescoping pool sweep is not within uh, the scope. You're okay to bring that in and, and distribute it to your U.S. clients. Uh, and then I've had uh, the, the opportunity to represent clients locally who said, we've been, inter uh, we've been importing this stuff for 20 years. Our brokers down in Miami told us it's okay. I said, well, it's not okay. It's plainly within the scope. And I would submit that the, uh, the balance that uh, I think it was Jim mentioned, uh, and, and certainly Michelle mentioned the emphasis on enforcement, and it's not in name only. The scale is very much enforcement right there. There's the thumb. And CBP doesn't need a new law to widely interpret, broadly interpret these scope rulings. And I end up trying to fight the good fight, as, as Dan said, uh, very often on, on the import side. But I'm also handling a lot of export matters, uh, which tend to be interesting, but not for today. All right, well, uh, John actually touched on this a little bit already. Um, you know, what, what some of the challenges are in getting into this field, uh, what some of the challenges you faced uh, when you started your career. Right, and I forgot my disclaimer that all opinions are my own and do not represent the Department of Commerce. Um, I would say uh, on the trade litigation side, well, in trade in general, our bar is very small, um, at least to ADCVD. And so it's challenging to break in, period. I think um, you have to be know that that's what you want and really push, push, push to get there. Um, to, to get my clerkship at the CIT, I ended up reaching out to every single attorney I knew and said, do any of you know anyone in trade law? Because I kept getting no's, 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 no's. I can't even, like, maybe 200 no's. I don't know. And um, eventually, an, a, a friend of a friend who worked in um, trust and states law had a friend who clerked at the CIT. And so I was able to start making connections and start networking. Um, but once you're there, um, you know, it's it's a great field to be in because it is such a small bar and there's such really di distinguished practitioners so you get to learn a lot. So I would say getting in in the first place is, is the tough part, but if you're tenacious, you can do it. Thank you. Dan, got any? No, I, I think that's a, a good way to say it. I mean, I, I was along the lines of John. I've taken a, a, a windy path. I, I started my career as a as a federal judicial law clerk, career law clerk with for a U.S. federal judge for for ten years. Meanwhile, taught here and and helped uh, as Ted does now the uh, running our Canada U.S. Law Institute here. But then I went to work for the Canadian government. If you would have told me that you know managing the Canada U.S. border for for ten years, I, I mean I I just don't know how that would have ever even crossed my thought process. But I think the one, two comments I would say is, for those of you that are interested in the field, yes, there's the trade remedies litigation side, and, and you know that that bar is, uh, you know, it's a cloistered order in many way, and you know, there's, you know, and it's it's a fun group of people. We're all, you know, the trade cases are all about 
washers, fasteners, and screws, you know, screws, <laughs> nuts, and bolts, and that describes most of us that, that practice in this area. <laughs> but um, but the, other, the other piece of it is I, I would be very careful to not narrow myself just to the trade remedies area. I mean, there, there's certainly a security component, you know, with working with USCBP. Um, I, the next horizon, I think, are, are, it's not even the next horizon, it's presently is the behind the border type issues, regulatory alignment, regulatory cooperation. In fact, you know, maybe jumping ahead a minute, um, I actually believe the language of trade will be regulation. Uh, and, and just because the politics aren't there, I happen to, and this is being recorded, I want to be careful here, work with a certain governor from a certain state with, in which we're sitting on his views on trade during a certain presidential race. I didn't expect him to go to the White House and shake the president's hand and promote TPP, but that was that was his choice. Um, but there are a, a lot of different issues uh, that are here that are trade. Uh, but I would also I think it's really important as well that you maintain that you that you have your domestic legal knowledge as well. I mean, I was with a Chinese client here in, in, on Wednesday that's acquiring a household name kind of northeastern Ohio company. But on the one minute, we're talking about complex international trade issues on some of their customs and, and some export controls issues. And the next minute, we're talking about, you know, they're, they're concerned as directors now. What's, what's piercing the corporate veil mean? You know, so, um, you know, and it's like, oh, I, I knew that for the bar exam, you know. Um, but, you know, um, okay, I know it regularly, too. But, I mean, those are the types of things you have to consider. So I'll pass it over. You know, and I'll echo a lot of what Heather said, but I also will say that, you know, for me, I had the put in the door because of Heather. Heather helped me out immensely. And I don't think uh, Dan knows this, but he's helped me out too because he introduced me to Dick Cunningham when uh, he came to speak a case when I was a student and Dan was still working here. Um, and, you know, I still keep in touch with Dick Cunningham and he's given me advice over the, you know, month, most frequent, like, you know, past couple of months. Um, and it's really just establishing these connections and, you know, keeping up on them and, you know, uh, being active as much as you can with, you know, the various, with SIPA, with there's an ABA committee on international trade, um, and not just joining those things. When you're a student, joining these things is free, but you can also, you know, get involved. Off, you volunteer to, you know, write articles about a new case or about an issue that you see or you've heard about. Um, and just be, making calculated efforts like that is really, really good. Um, I, I think just to uh, build on that point, you know, the, the uh, local bar association, Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, has an international law section. I'm sad to say that right now it's lost a bit of momentum. Uh, I'm a former chair. Uh, we also have uh, locally the Greater International uh, Cleveland. Wait a minute, the Greater Cleveland International Lawyers Group. Henry King. Henry King excuse me. I was remiss in uh, properly naming it. Thanks, Dan. Uh, which meets monthly. Has Dick Cunningham come in uh, in a few weeks, I think, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, um, as well as other practitioners from various countries. And those are opportunities that are open to you as students. Uh, and that, I think, helps to, uh, to make some of those early connections uh, that uh, Zach just mentioned. Um, the challenges, uh, I, I know all the challenges because I did it alone, but I'm still here and I'm still practicing and I do it locally. I was chirping earlier uh, on, on the last panel, did not mean to be disrespectful, but I am here and I'm doing it on both sides, import and export. What makes it interesting day to day, going back to the first question for me, Ted, is I do sanctions work as well. Um, and that's like keeping up with current affairs. So uh, th there's a lot of opportunities. It certainly goes beyond trade remedy, uh, and, and you should consider it all. All right. Uh, we'll shift gears a little bit. We've got some time left. Uh, if you could just talk a little bit about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, what the real focus of your practice is at this point, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, so we kind of um, function as in-house counsel for a – Department of the Department of Commerce. So they come to us with any questions they have. It's the enforcement and compliance, like Michelle was saying earlier. Um, and they're the uh, major brains of our operation, all the analysts, the economists, the accountants, um, and the assistant undersecretary. So they'll call us and say, can we do this? Is it legal? 
what do you think about this? So on a day-to-day, -day, I would say 60% um, of my job is answering like client, client questions, um, ch checking for legality, things that are going to be published, uh, problem solving, sitting in meetings with um, different decision makers, going to Michelle and other um, assistant chief counsel and uh, talking through issues with them. So, um, and then the other 40% hat is the litigation side, which I guess I, I didn't really mention, but I, one of the reasons I love what we do, it's writing briefs and um, working with the Department of Justice for on strategy. There are attorneys in my office who work on WTO briefs, and um, we just had a big NAFTA oral argument. So I'd say it's a 60-40 uh, litigation hat and administrative uh, in-house counsel hat is what I do. Thank you. Dan? Uh, my practice is a, li a little extraordinary, uh, not not in terms of success, but extraordinary in terms of being odd um, in, in, the, in the sense that, uh, you know, I will do trade remedies. We're, we're involved in, in the never-ending softwood lumber dispute uh, um, and, and uh, BC brewers and all kinds of things going on. Um, in terms of Canada, U.S. and aluminum extrusions and other types of things, uh, rebar, tiny Chinese steel, et cetera. But uh, I often will not be the one going into the courtroom these days um, uh, just because another major part, a lot of my practice is helping companies um, that are just entering export markets or, or, or importing. So we're doing a lot of that, uh, that type of work, you know, getting companies up and, and established uh, and moving in that phase. So that's kind of a lot of nuts and bolts type work there going to argue. You know, my goal is is hopefully to never see the Court of International Trade with some of our clients because if they're arguing about a customs classification, they're not they're not they're not making money, frankly, at that point, unless they're selling you know significant amounts. So our job is to get it right in the first instance and so um, so that they're they're moving things across international boundaries. Now that my law partners don't want to hear that, of course, they want to hear the dispute part of it. But uh, in terms of the billable hours, the second piece of my job is that I spend a lot of my time. I, I manage our Canada U.S. platform. We have 274 lawyers doing Canada U.S. work every day. So I have the privilege of coordinating lawyers. You never manage lawyers. You coordinate your, your partners. Um, so some of that has to do with some accounting and, and building client service teams and, and out there talking to clients, which is is what I like to do. And the third piece, which is a little bit of my question earlier, is as I spend a lot of time on the government relations side working on the policy shop, which obviously is keeping us very busy. Um, well, I, spent mo I spend most of my time on the Hill, um, and both this Hill and Parliament Hill, uh, as well as our state capitals, trying to, to do some things differently on trade and, and on other areas and help the think tank community and other type of people. So it's, it's a unique kind of practice, not one well designed for the billable hour model, but fortunately, I have benevolent uh, folks that, that you know understand that and, and compensate accordingly. And then 100% of what I do is, um, you know, drafting opinions, um, orders on motions uh, for for Judge Ridgeway, and it's like I said, it's a really interesting job. So, just cast that one on. Uh, I don't have a day to day that looks the same, uh, like many lawyers. Um, and, and that's partly because I would term myself as a generalist and as far as international trade work goes, and I've hinted at that or already discussed it a bit. Um, so you know, the other day I got an email from uh, a, a decent sized law firm here in town. Hey, we've got a client and they need some help on some ITAR uh, issues, uh, which you know governs defense articles and what they're going to do and what technology is involved. And then I jump from that kind of work into uh, having to send a report off to uh, a client locally that's owned by a Belgian conglomerate and uh, is considering opening up uh, a maquilador operation down in Mexico and how the finished products are going to be classified and whether or not they're going to qualify under NAFTA, which some will, some won't. Um, and then uh, I was mentioning, Larry and I were talking at the first break, I, I've got to respond to uh, a special agent at the other side of the Department of Commerce because they enforce, there's that enforcement word again, um, the, uh, the regulations, the Export Administration regulations. And uh, a client of mine in upstate New York is being investigated for 
an unlicensed shipment to Dubai, um, and I have to respond to the agent's requests, and they will be considering whether to uh, uh, bring a potential uh, administrative penalty action against clients. So it, it varies day to day, uh, and that, that uh, makes it challenging. Uh, sometimes I feel like a, a catcher in a baseball game, and they whip off their mask and helmet and look for the pop fly, and hopefully I can catch more than come down on my head. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I guess looking more generally, what do you see as some of the major issues and trends that are really affecting currently and also could be coming down the pike here soon? Oh, I think with our office, and I forget who mentioned this, I think it was maybe Dominic, but we are seeing a ton of, or we're initiating on a ton of petitions coming in the door. So I think that one of the trends for us is a lot of more companies seem to be using these tools that are available to them to, um, to enforce anti-dumping. Some other things, China 2016, like Michelle said, just check the news, you'll find out all about that. Um, the steel cases are a really big deal right now. You guys probably heard about that in the uh, debates. Um, so we're seeing a lot of work there. Um, scope issues, which are really interesting. You see some of the most interesting arguments of why something is or is not in the scope. Um, and I see a lot of new ways to evade, which is very interesting to me as an attorney, <laughs> or not evade, depending on the situation. Um, and we, I, I personally am seeing a lot of new shipper reviews. I, I don't know if you guys, so if, if there's an order in place, um, you're a new company, you come in, you can apply, say, hey, I'm a new shipper, so I shouldn't be subject to this order. Um, I'm seeing a lot more of those come in towards the end of the year. So um, just new ways of companies finding out how to use the anti-dumping laws to their effect or detriment. No, I think, yeah, I, I mean, I touched on that you know i'm not sure if you know high levels of petitions for ad cbd cases is a good thing for the overall economy i'm not sure what if that means we're ending into a recession or if it means more companies are trading uh you know i've never seen really a good economic analysis of that what we're looking at for the business i know it's good for our business but uh, you know like i said you know softwood lever has been good for our business for a long time i'm not necessarily sure it's great for the north american economy or at least the can us economy i, I do think uh, regulatory cooperation it's, it's just the number one fear factor frustration for companies that that do international trade it's yes there's there's tariff issues in getting goods and services across borders and their value chains those types of things but once they're there, the behind the border type issues um, that are getting them, there's a new term that's being floated around, a relatively new trade echo. What happens once the, the container lands in a foreign country or when it lands here, what's happening at that stage of the game, the echo of, of trade and that companies have to deal with, you know, particularly when US CBP and others want to, you know, come back five years later or three years later and, and you know, re enforce certain rules regulations. Agriculture, uh, one of the things that is, you know, which is the like, that and government procurement are still the last true vestiges of procurement, but keep in mind that the U.S. is changing its its Food Safety Regulation, uh, Food Safety Modernization Act, FISMA regime right now. Um, Canada is actually doing the same thing simultaneously for the first time in 80 years. Um, that should lead to some interesting developments at our ports of entry. These aren't containers of car parks that are going to be, these aren't transmission kits that are going to be sitting at borders right now. It's going to be, um, you know, food, perishable, perishable goods, because we do import a significant amount of our agri-food. So I think, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, you get into some pretty nasty stuff when you get into that industry. Uh, it, it, you know, in certain areas, beef is one of my things. We, we always show the car that crosses the Canada-US border 12 to 6 times, or 12 times, 6 to 12 times in the assembly process. We never show the beef uh, because the end of that process is pretty pretty messy uh, of that supply chain. Um, but uh, I will say for me, um, the number one issue that our companies face is, is not trading goods right now. It's actually trading the movement of people. Uh, because when you're if you're a manufacturer, when you're selling something to a foreign foreign port uh, foreign customer, if you're not just selling the good anymore, you're sending the person to to train, install, and service. And, you know, you take our global immigration regimes, so much of the immigration debate is focused on low-skilled, low undocumented workers and, or highly skilled workers. 
the system isn't really set up to deal with the current manufacturing economy. Take, for example, the NAFTA immigration regime, which was state-of-the-art in 1994, hasn't been updated since then. So try to move um, internet or, you know, service providers, you know, it's, uh, when it, which didn't exist in 1994, by the way. Um, so, you know, those are, Al Gore hadn't invented it yet. But, um, <laughs> you know, so that's a big issue that most of our companies are dealing with. So in international trade, I've become kind of a, an immigration lawyer in many ways, too, just trying to figure out how to, and that's from structuring, you know, how you corporate structure the company has implications for those types of things as well. So those are kind of the hot issues right now. And to build on that, I think one of the really interesting issues that I really wasn't all that familiar in when I started at the court, and it's not something that we see day in and day out, but it's something that I've sort of come across. It's just like country of origin issues are really, really interesting. And if you're a student here, you should talk to Professor Calaris about that. He'll help you out. He'll talk to you about it. And it's a really complicated area of law, and it's something that um, is probably a ton of opportunities in uh, if you're interested. I think that's where I would agree with what's being said out on the campaign trail is if we could renegotiate rules of origin, it would make everyone's lives a little simpler, um, although it would take away some of those billable hours Dan mentioned. Um, uh, what was the question again, Ted? What are we, where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? I, I, I defend a lot of penalty cases, import and export and, and sanctions. Um, I think my litigation background is quite helpful uh, in, in responding to those cases, but often those are silly cases, and I think that there's an overreach, um, and I suspect that uh, there's a lot of pressure coming from Capitol Hill because CBP uh, does not want to uh, have the commissioner have to be hauled up to testify, and, and folks in the Commerce Department uh, don't want to be uh, uh, called on the carpet about why there's not more, uh, you know, uh, fuller and, and, and uh, more strict enforcement of trade remedies and the orders that are out there. Uh, I, I see a continuation and, and growth in, in enforcement of, of trade laws uh, in, in general, both on the import and the export side. I think I'll be busy for a while. All right, thank you. Um, at this point, we just have a few minutes left, so I'd like to open it up to any uh, people who might have questions for our panelists, uh, covering any range of topics, what they work in, uh, questions about their studies. You only get to I know. Add add the the boss is asking a question. <laughs> well, I, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Why were you late? Well, hopefully this will, <laughs> okay, hopefully this will benefit everybody. Um, because Heather came from the Court of International Trade as a law clerk to the agency, and I was just going to ask her if there's anything that she wishes she had known when she was a clerk about how things work that she now understands that she's at the agency, if that's not too broad of a question. Well, Michelle, I feel like it was Wizard of Oz pulling back the curtain and really understanding there are like a hundred moving parts when these agency decisions, at least for us, come out. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, different competing interests in these decisions. So at the court, you know, you just see the end product and there's no, um, you don't see the back and forth and the, the go behind. Um, had I known, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what kind of, I would still be reading the law as with the judicial hat on, but um, I think it would have given me a lot deeper understanding. Uh, so that's always a, you know, I think a clerkship is such a great opportunity. I really would push you all to try to clerk at any level. I mean, the uh, the guidance you get, like Judge Gordon wasn't my judge, but like the, the brains that these judges have are just incredible. So you can get a lot of litigation and writing skills. And then, um, you know, even if you're at an agency, you can pop back over to a court and, and get that side of things. So I think that if I had better understood the workings, that would have been a much more interesting approach as a clerk. I have a quick question. Uh, and this is uh, just more for my current students and uh, the, the, the first years of who might be here, who, who might be my future students. Uh, everybody here agrees that trade practice is a very fact-intensive, uh, 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 is very fact-intensive. 
nobody disagrees that what is an aluminum extrusion you may have to find a whole lot more than you care about <laughs> what a, about aluminum but uh, a very important thing to do uh, is to become familiar with the the with what's happening in the world of trade so a big suggestion that uh, I took on uh, in law school was to sign up for either BNA or West Law News on on trade and a lot of things are going to be very difficult in the beginning but over time things are going to be clear because you, you've been reading about these issues so many many times that you you're going to you become more familiarized my question now to to uh, to the the to uh, the, the, for, the current clerk and the former clerk is to what extent uh, do you think uh, the law, stu law school students should be motivated by their professors to read not only the opinions but also the briefs that the lawyers are writing and to what extent do you think that really helped you become a better lawyer? <laughs> so I think one of the things that is really interesting um, is you know the Court of International Trade is not that big of a court based on the number of opinions that come out of there. I think they're probably up to 120 this year. I mean, it that wouldn't take you that long if you're really interested in this area of law, just to check the court's website every week and take a quick look at the four or five opinions that have come out. Um, but then you get the question of, well, what were the arguments versus how did the judge interpret the arguments? And you can go back to the briefs. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to, if there's a case that you find particularly interesting, uh, go back and do that. And then, I mean, to go, you can, I mean, you're still students. You can contact the attorneys and say, you know, I was reading the opinion, you know, Judge Gordon's opinion in your case on this. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Wanna, can I talk to you more about that? And you, you can all still do that. And it would be probably, you get pretty, most people would be willing to talk to you about that. I think it's like a great idea for networking because I think, again, networking is so important um, for your first job. Uh, other, will you have the time to do that? I don't, I don't know. I, I did that in law school. <laughs> now I do, and as a clerk. Um, one other way, Washington Trade Daily is a great, like, you know, I know we get in this world of like Twitter and quick news is a great way to find things you're interested in. Larry has an amazing customs law blog. I was just telling him it's my way to stay in tune with what's going on in the customs world. It's very entertaining. Um, so you can, you're welcome. <laughs> a little shout out for the. Did you vote for it? Vote for it? For Simba. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, then, you know, you can almost like any kind of legal research, you, you use these third party level resources and then find the court cases and, and then you can dig into a brief if you're interested, write an article about it. Um, so yeah, and it, I think if you find a very interesting uh, case, they're very helpful because again, it's you're seeing what the parties are saying, not how the judge is interpreting what they said. Can I, can I just quickly, on, on the GPX case, have you read the briefs? And okay, so you, you've seen what the constitutional and, and the argument that it was not a constitutional, I, I don't think it was even 90 days, was it? It's like lightning. It's like what? Congress acted? They did something? That, um, but, but, but that, uh, to, to the point being made here, is, is you know, a great opportunity to understand what those arguments are. Maybe you come up with better arguments. Why didn't they make this argument? Or... I understand why the court ruled the way it did, and that informs your own legal thinking and your own analysis, and that's going to be critical because that's going to be your, your, your bread and butter as you go forward in your career. All right, I know we have a couple more questions. I believe we have um, one in the back there. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm an international student. I'm from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, uh, the United States is the, big, uh, the biggest uh, trade uh, partner of my uh, country, and uh, we have a lot of companies work with, uh, I mean, uh, with American company, uh, companies in the uh, United States. And my question is that as an international student, I have, uh, like, study trade law, uh, I mean, uh, WTO. But I want to be familiar with American domestic law related to international 
trade the law so I can advise my uh, future clients back home. Which area of law I should focus in the United States? Well, obviously, I think uh, trade remedies, so that's anti-dumping, countervailing duty, but customs is another huge piece of the pie. You know, Dan, you guys would probably speak this. I mean, for, in terms of going, well, first and first and foremost, uh, thank you for coming to the Case Western. I, I think it's, you've, you've made a great choice. But uh, also, um, you know, if you're going to go, if you're talking about going back to, to Saudi Arabia yes. to advise your your client, I mean, most first and foremost, they're going to want to know how to do business here, which is, you know, standard corporate law, you know, so. Mm -hmm. BA, uh, one in BA and BA and others, <laughs> and so uh, those types of those types of things. The other um, uh, case, Western has become a leader to on kind of financial integrity sanctions law as well, um, which certainly will come into play in that context. Um, you, you know, in terms of uh, bringing goods and services here, uh, I spend a lot of my time in that area. Uh, so. Again, you know, but I think you really need to make sure that you're covering your domestic bases here, just understanding basic constitutional principles, yep. things of that nature. Yeah, I, I would add litigation. We are the most lit litigious society in the world. <laughs> and uh, it, as, as Judge uh, pointed out in his, his uh, speech this morning, uh, we're a common law country. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the way that our court cases are decided is is very unknown and in the discovery process of why do I have to turn over all of these documents to the other side um, so understanding something about the litigation process as well as uh, the fact that you should probably be arbitrating those international disputes um, <laughs> would uh, I think serve you well also thank you so much guys I think we have one more question. Yeah, up front. Dan and John, uh, in programs that I've done around the, the country, one of the things that I've noticed is there are a lot more opportunities than one thinks uh, well, relative to whether it's trade remedies or traditional uh, customs law, et cetera. Um, would you comment for a couple of moments about what I'll call being open to the possibility? So, for example, if you're doing insurance defense work, you know, you find out all of a sudden you're working with a surety who's working with a common carrier who's moving goods uh, from the United States to Mexico or vice, or vice versa, the United States to Canada. And that then leads into all sorts of litigation when there's a or disputes when, when there's a problem about, you know, who along the line in the chain is ultimately liable or responsible and how that works out among the uh, the parties. Uh, the other comment th that I'd like to ask you to focus about is um, writing, right? Uh, a lot of folks get their hands dirty doing the transactions and there's a lot of telephone conversations, but you know, how do you make yourself valuable as a young lawyer to an agency, a court for a clerkship or, or, or a firm in, in terms of your writing skills? I'll refer to my senior yeah, the guy with a few grades, right? <laughs> um, well, let, let me tackle the writing aspect first. Uh, it, it, I mean, you, you have to be able to communicate in good written language. It's that simple. That's a challenge for many of you, you students here because English is not your first language. Uh, but you, you have to be able to show that your, even if your English written language skills are not perfect, are not as precise as you would like them to be. I've had many clerks, associates that I've hired from the LLM program as well as uh, from JD program over the years from this school and the one down the street. And even where English was not the first language, I could see that the analysis was sound. And that, that's going to, I think, serve you well. You, you can get better over time with writing. And certainly I wasn't uh, an all-star writer when I first started. And I know, I'm not sure that I've gotten a whole lot better, but I think I have and keeping it concise. You know, I, I try to teach, I have four sons and I try to teach them. Challenge the teacher, 
just what they want to hear, <laughs> right? Why does it have to be five page, uh, a five-page uh, you know, report if I can say it in three and make those points? Keep it concise because folks like Zach <laughs> and the judge, they don't <laughs> want to read lengthy briefs. And you'll learn that, and it, it, you, I'm sure you have already, that there are page limits and word limits. Um, and don't try to get cute with font size and, and spreading out the margin and all this other nonsense. Get to the heart of the points you need to make and, uh, and move on. Yeah, yeah, just on the writing side, and, and I'll, I'll tackle the, the openness question. Um, uh, I, I just echo that. It, it, to me, of the many gifts that I received from clerking for a federal judge for as long as I did, was the, uh, the ability to practice writing. It's a lifelong art. Uh, I had to transition a few times because you learn how to write, you know, in a courtroom every day. And then I went back into to the dark side of private practice for for a while there. And then I, I had to write like a human being again, which you know, <laughs> clients don't like to see the phrase inextricably intertwined in their letters. <laughs> you, know, you, know, uh, you know, but then coming back, and then I went to government, and, and you know, writing a, where brevity, it, it, you know, bre I think brevity is, 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 as you can see, my my strongest challenge even in writing. I mean, I, I practice work on it every single day of my life, just even what you put in an email. If, if, I know when I'm dealing with my transactional lawyers that I, you know, that email better not be longer than two lines because they're just not going to read, not because, uh, you know, I, I defer to them. I just know they're not going to read it. And clients don't have the time to and read clients something don't read long either. Things. It is the most important skill. I, I think not only the way you're learning to think here in law school, but it's the most important skill. In terms of openness, I, I do think, you know, you guys have already taken step one, I guess, by coming to Case Western number two. By being in this room today, I mean, Heather, everybody's touched on the importance of networking and being out there, doing things additional to, to what you need to do. I, I just can't emphasize that it, it is a who you know kind of world, and, and you never can underestimate those networks that, that you have. Um, I also think that our profession will be the one uh, of the commoditization of legal services will probably be toward the end of that evolution just because uh, there's a lot of corporate lawyers in this world and they're brilliant, I love them, and there's a lot of you know, insolvency lawyers, et cetera. Um, there's just not a lot of people that understand this language and jargon and things of this nature. Uh, but but to, the, to, to the judge's question, I also noticed that not all of these are law jobs. Um, they're not always posted in you know, the traditional legal. Uh, there are a lot of regulatory compliance jobs out there that quite frankly are doing a lot more legal work than <laughs> Probably they should be, um, uh, but I mean they are well suited to to uh, uh, I think regulatory compliance, transportation law is another big area right now, which really touches on everything we do, the three PL world. Uh, you know, just because I think look at what our economy is doing, we're not making as much, but the the competitive advantage that the United States has, if we you know build infrastructure, is we can move these goods a lot faster. So, uh, but you need people that understand the intersections of how international works. So. I think, you know, my career has been a testament to just being open, you know, I've not always made the right decision, but I, I've had some great guidance along the way, but uh, I, I didn't come in with here's my set view on, on how the world should look. Let, let me just say real, sorry, Dan, no, uh, real, real quickly, I, you know, I'm still here. Um, I had to be open as a sole practitioner and small firm leader. Uh, you have to be able to... Uh, see the entire chessboard, I think, was, was Michelle's uh, uh, metaphor earlier. Uh, I, I always say you, you have to be able to connect the dots. You have to be able to see within that decision to make a prior disclosure to customs or not, do I have to worry about a competitor or more likely someone on the inside who might be a trade compliance professional within my organization who's going to file that sealed key time, you know, complaint. And who do I need to communicate with? And how do I need to communicate with that small group? So you have to be able to, uh, and that comes with experience, of course, but the sooner you can begin to recognize that uh, the, the, there's a lot of different areas and issues that you need to be thinking about and assessing, I think uh, it, it's it will serve you well. You've got some great examples here. Sorry, uh, no, I was going to say quickly, my very short career too, don't be dissuaded. Like if you have a goal, like for me, I, I started in um, international criminal litigation. I knew that I wanted to do trade law, 
but I wasn't finding any segue with what I was applying for, so I did international criminal litigation. Um, it was the most depressing job I've ever had in my life. <laughs> um, but I started learning those skills of Judge Gordon was talking about, the writing. I remember I had a German prosecutor, my first memo brief uh, to him, and he took it, he's like, this is terrible. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and so take that feedback and just, you know, build from it. Learn from your mistakes and, and keep fine-tuning your writing and your, your, your advocacy skills. You know, so I kept my foot in the litigation side. I did some toxic tort litigation because I moved to New York when Dewey and LaBeouf went under, <laughs> not understanding the whole um, private side of law. And then um, and ended up, you know, transitioning into trade litigation, which is where I wanted to be. So just keep trying and look at different avenues. Um, uh, like Dan was talking about, there's so many different sides of trade and, and litigation. So just keep trying and keep working on your writing. All right. Well, thank you so much. Let's give our great panelists a round of applause. <laughs> and if they have time, they'll hopefully stick around and answer whatever qu other questions you have. But. So we are basically done with our conference. I hope you come next year. We're trying to make this an annual event. And uh, let's uh, 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 thank you so much for, for being here and for your questions. And uh, uh, let's uh, thank once more our great panel. Yeah, I'm, I'm based in Columbus, but uh, I bounce between. I spend about a third of my time.